And now, let's join Ace Broadcaster, Mamode Akuga, as he takes us inside the Niger Delta. Hello out there and welcome to the program. It's Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil-rich region. I'm your regular host, Mamode Akuga. Presidential and National Assembly elections took place all over the country last Saturday, and states in the Niger Delta were not exempted. However, reports of violence, ballot box snatching, incomplete election materials arriving very late to polling units, and outright loss of lives characterize the electioneering process in some states in the region. We'll take a look at that. Recently, in the Niger Delta, it was observed that the oil-rich Bielsa, Aquaibom, and Delta states had skillfully used the electioneering period to showcase their achievements in the transport sector of their respective economies. In Bielsa state, we witnessed the landing of a maiden flight at the international airport, which was commissioned on the same occasion. For his part, Aquaibom launched the state-owned airline, also known as Ebom Air, with the unveiling of two aircrafts, with more aircrafts being expected. While both projects have continued to receive wide applause as a major boost to the aviation and tourism sectors of the economy, what we witnessed in Delta State was the commissioning of 40 buses that will add to the fleet of the alien Delta lines. No doubt, the commission of these projects is aimed at shoring up support for their political parties and governorship ambitions, while the airport and the airline projects of Bielsa and Aquaibom states are commendable and worthy of states receiving 13% oil derivation, the launch of 40 buses by the oil-rich Delta state government leaves a lot more questions than answers. And now to the main issues of this edition of the program. We begin with an engaging interview with Dr. Marvin Dekil, coordinator of the Hydrocarbon Pollution Remediation Project, HyPrep. We eventually got HyPrep to react to alleged failure to follow the recommendations of UNEP in the implementation of the 2011 report of the United Nations Agency on Oil Pollution in Ogoniland. Next on our lineup is the people's reaction to the recent looting of a vocational training center established by the Presidential Amnesty Program in Kayama Town, headquarters of Kulukma Upukma local government area of Bios State. And we will wrap up this edition of the program with a report that captures the people's mood in Kula Kingdom of Akukutoro local government area of River State, where indigenous oil giant Belema Oil Producing Limited is redefining the concept of corporate social responsibility. Inside the Niger Delta, we'll be back in just a moment. Don't go away. Inside the Niger Delta. Criticisms trailing the implementation of the UNEP report on the oil pollution in Ogoniland heightened recently following the handover of polluted sites to contracting firms. According to critics of the Ogoni Cleanup Project, there is nothing on ground to suggest that the process has commenced despite the handing over of polluted sites to contractors. In an interview with Inside the Niger Delta, High Preps coordinator Marvin Dekil, however, insists that the cleanup project is on course. Well, well, I think we should start by really commending the federal government for taking this bold step. Environmental challenges in Ogoni land and Niger Delta at large are something, are things, is a problem we live with, like I said previously, for over four decades. It's always been there, but this is the first time the federal government has started that. We have companies on site right now in Ogoni land doing the remediation. What that means is that the cleanup of the Niger Delta has started beginning in Ogoni land, and that is commendable. It's something we should appreciate the government for giving us this opportunity. I think that um, as a people, we must find a better way to be receptive to government projects. Rather than have projects, um, government um, starting projects, and we become recalcitrant, and we become a problem in the implementation of the project. By and large, I will tell you that the Ogoni people have the most receptive to, to, the, to the project. There are people who, are, who have their own reason for disagreeing with the project. A lot of time it might be political, it might be selfish, but the generality of Ogoni people whose land we are cleaning are very happy. You see that on their faces each time you move into the community. 
You see that on their faces each time you're interacting with them. The bulk of the people on our livelihood program are very young uh, people from poor background. The women we're going to be training, a lot of them are widows, people who actually do need help. These are the people that truly really need this project. Not those ones with so much money that go to the media to criticize what it is to be benefiting them, that give conditions before they can accept help and accept support of a project that should be impacting positively on their lives. So as a people, including leadership, we have to find a way to be more receptive to government projects. And this is one project that we should start from. The controversy surrounding the Ogoni cleanup project also borders on allegations of financial misappropriation for which the Ogoni Youth Federation is already in court with HyPrep. People need to understand the way HyPrep works, our governing structures. We have a board of trustees, we have a governing council, and we have the project coordination office. All these structures work independent of each other. And it was done for transparency and efficiency of operations. What that means is that the BOT, they hold the money. They receive the money and they hold the money and they manage the money, okay? The governing council develop and approve the policies that the project coordination office submits. And for us to spend a dime in the project coordination office, one naira to be spent here, we get approval for that money from the governing council, who then instructs or directs the board of trustees to release the money. So it is not possible within the administrative structure of HyPrev for money to be appropriated or misapplied, no. And so when somebody comes and says X amount is missing, it means the person does not have an idea of how things work here. The money that has been released to this project for specific activities, it's all well, very well accounted for. And like I said, the board of trustees that are responsible for managing the fund of this project is in they have all the records straight as to what we have received. We received our initial $10 million, and that is what we have worked with. We have also received further monies which we have used to pay the contractors who are on site. Our expenditure is all um, based on budget approved by the governing council. Our documents, all such documents, are, of, are of available to the public for scrutiny. On the alleged marginalization of Ogonis in the award of contracts, Marvin Deku said High Prep only followed the Procurement Act and was poised to build capacity for Ogonis and other contracting firms engaged in the cleanup project. Now to Bielsa State. A presidential amnesty program for repentant militants in the Niger Delta suffered a setback when recently its vocational center at Kayama in Kolokuma, Pukuma, local government area of Bielsa State, was vandalized and property worth billions of naira cutted away by residents of the area. Correspondent Tekena Amiofuri reports that the incident has continued to generate mixed reactions in the Niger Delta. The shocking raid on the Amnesty Training Center was said to have been carried out by youths and women in Urubiri community, where the multi billion naira office complex is located. The marauding villagers, with the help of their neighbors, reportedly subdued few security operatives stationed to secure the facility and made away with various items including starter packs and electronic gadgets. Reports have it that several persons were injured while two died following a stampede that accompanied the raid. We condemn it in all entirety. I do not see it as a way forward because in the Niger Delta we have suffered a lot. And this is also a setback because that program was supposed to increase and improve the livelihoods of the people, mostly around that community. Why is it now that when the place has been equipped with some materials that needs to be going out, then you now have people come to vandalize it? And the vandalization did not take place in minutes, hours. It took place in days. That, I think, is a well-planned, orchestrated act against the people of, against the amnesty program, also against the people of the community putting the community in the forefront of all of this. In another breath, the action of the Kayama invaders is viewed as a reflection of an existing disconnection between the presidential amnesty program and the communities it was designed to benefit. At the peak of unrest in the Niger Delta, the federal government made an offer of amnesty to repentant militants on June 25, 2009. Those who surrendered their arms enlisted in the amnesty program under a disarmament, demobilization, 
and reintegration framework and became eligible for job training and a monthly stipend of 65,000 Naira. While some of those trained are gainfully employed, others yet to secure paid jobs have their monthly stipends to depend on. It however appears that the level of satisfaction with the federal government's amnesty program is low as a greater number of vulnerable persons who did not participate in the armed struggle preceding the presidential pardon may have been left to their fates. Some actually came out of it, offered themselves to be rehabilitated and took that rehabilitation very seriously. Some others didn't. There's a relapse. These are some sociological variables that could predispose community people who ought to be defenders of projects in their community to now become those who attack those kind of uh, projects. And for women also to get involved, the economy is also part of the problem. The environment is also part of the problem. There are those who go fishing, prewinkles and all that. The environment is terribly degraded. That those, that environment that normally sustain the rural economy can no longer do so. And so when somebody is dispossessed, when somebody is angry, when somebody is also hungry, these are factors that can predispose somebody who behave normally to begin to imbibe abnormal behavior. Very, very sad development. But a few factors are responsible when community folks act like this. Primarily, it would be that indication that something unjust is going on about those equipment. The challenge would be that information has filtered to the community and the, the beneficiary that somebody is doing something untoward. That is, there is no uh, equity in the distribution of those things. That's why the community force is okay. Rather than let some, a few persons hijack what belongs to all of us, let's go and do a free for all. The presidential amnesty program in the Niger Delta which was designed to terminate in 2015, has witnessed several reforms under the administration of President Muhammadu Buhari. Only recently, the program's coordinator, Professor Charles Dokubo, hinted that there is henceforth no terminal date for the amnesty program. That program was just an interim program designed alongside other, you know, development-oriented programs that have a long lifespan. Uh, this is supposed to be a short program, short-term program. But if you continue to expand, extend, elongate it, because it has become a patronage agency, becomes a patronage program, where people think that um, it is their own uh, kind of, the boys call it their cocoa farm, because certain stipends come. The amnesty office need to, in the context of what is happening, also do its own internal self-assessment to know the extent to which the program is meeting target to also know from the people who are the target beneficiaries whether really the program is meeting their expectations. Over the years, the Presidential Amnesty Program has successfully reduced the tax on crude oil and gas facilities in the Niger Delta. But the region is still rife with violent crimes and agitations, as evident in the recent Kayama invasion. Most Niger Deltans would want the federal government to adopt a more holistic approach to the implementation of the program to the extent that the non-violent actors in the Niger Delta struggle get a fair share of its intervention in the region. Inside the Niger Delta. Welcome back. Presidential and National Assembly elections, which were conducted all over the country last Saturday, experienced some hitches and violence in some states in the Niger Delta. In Delta State, most polling units did not receive electoral materials until 1 p.m. in the afternoon. In Igbide, in Isoko South local government area, not only did materials not arrive on time, malfunctioning card readers was also a major problem. I did my accreditation some 15 minutes ago at about uh, 25 minutes past 2. And uh, you can imagine that we have been here since 8 o'clock. The, the materials got here about uh, 1 p.m. and between that time and just a few minutes ago we are, they have been struggling with the card reader. Very very shameful process, very unfortunate. A situation where one, it takes, it's like 
because there's election, the whole country is shut down, everything is shut down, it's like everybody is waiting to be executed. So much tension, everything paralyzed, is so shameful. Judging by my experience, I think this election in this environment is designed to fail. In neighboring Olomoro community, voters were only able to cast their ballot for presidential and senatorial elections due to incomplete materials. When they were dropping all the materials, when I saw that uh, they dropped uh, two boxes, which was for uh, presidential and senatorial, and I was being inquisitive to ask, as, ah, where is the one for House of Rep? Then I said uh, something went wrong. And there, there's nothing for House of Rep in, in Olomoro community. I said, how can that be? So are people saying that we are not going to vote for House of Rep in this uh, uh, unit? They said it's not just this pulley unit. It's the whole of Olomoro community. And we are shocked. And up to this moment, we have not heard anything if we are going to do the rerun or not. We could not cast a ballot paper on House of Rep in Olomoro community. Also in Delta State, Violence marred the electoral process in some areas. Commissioner of Police in Delta State, Mr. Adeyinka Adeliki, has confirmed the death of two persons in Amupe near Sapele during the Saturday's elections. According to a news agency of Nigeria report, gunmen stormed the polling unit at about 12.55 p.m. when the voting was going on and shot the victims who died on the spot. In River State, an army lieutenant and five other persons died in a shootout during last Saturday's elections in Abonima, a Kukutoro local government area of River State. According to a statement from the acting director, Army Public Relations, Colonel Sajiri Musa, troops from 6th Division on a legitimate duty of protecting lives and properties of law-abiding citizens and ensuring a conducive environment for peaceful conduct of the 2019 general elections in Abonima, a Kukutoro local government area, River State, were attacked by some hoodlums. An amateur video footage from the scene looked and sounded like something from a CNN report on the crisis in Syria. Also in River State, a stray bullet hit and killed an INEC ad hoc staff, Ibiseki Amakri, while returning from election duty in Degema. And now to Bielsa State, where men of the 16th Brigade of the Nigerian Army in Yenogoa arrested 15 armed thugs during the presidential and national assembly elections in southern Ijo, local government area of Bielsa State. According to Major Jonah Danjuma, spokesman of the 16th Brigade, several arms and ammunition, amongst others, were recovered from armed hoodlums suspected to be political thugs. Governor of Bielsa State, Seraki Dixon, has called on INEC to reject results from some areas affected by thuggery and political violence. The governor condemned the killings and hijacking of electoral materials in areas such as Basambri, Olusiri, Opunembe, Agbre, Apoi, Azuzuama, and Korokurosei. Governor Dixon also directed the setting up of a commission of inquiry into electoral violence in Bielsa State. I call on IMEC to do what is right, immediately announce the rejection of the purported results from the seven wards or so of Basambri. My candidate is here, Chief Bless in the Pigas in Zagara, waiting to vote, like several thousands were waiting to vote in their communities. He never voted, never saw materials, no electoral officer came to his community or other communities. People assembled themselves, a gang of people, a gang of criminals, assembled themselves in Basambri to commit a crime. And we're waiting to see whether INEC will accept the outcome of that crime. The government of Bayelsa State will set up a commission of inquiry that will document again the roles and activities and identities of all officers, whether you are INEC, whether you are a coalition officer, whether you are an SPO, whether you are a returning officer, 
who works to authenticate a fraud and thereby participates in a criminal act, don't ask me what we will do with it. I have a duty to document this for posterity. The gradual involvement of Niger Deltans in the ownership and operation of oil blocks will eventually lead to the transformation of the Niger Delta region. This conclusion is based on the situation of Kula Kingdom, which has undergone rapid transformation following the intervention of an illustrious son of the kingdom, engineer Jack Ristain Jr., who is also founder and president of Belema Oil Producing Limited, operator of OML 55. To show their appreciation for this uncommon transformation and pledge their support to engineer Jack Ristain Jr., Kula people recently organized a Thanksgiving and prayer session in Kula Town, inside the Niger Delta, was there. The event was organized to pray for peace and prosperity in Kula Kingdom and to thank God for turning around the fortunes of a people who before this time suffered untold neglect and deprivation in the midst of plenty. It was also to thank God for the gift of an illustrious son who has worked tirelessly to uplift his people from the throes of poverty and deprivation. Engineer Jack Richtain Jr., a son of the soil, had in 2016 secured the license to operate OML 55, which encompasses Kula Kingdom. Jack Richtain's vision for his native Kula Kingdom, which is expressed through the instrumentality of Belema Oil Producing Limited, has in less than three years since the indigenous oil giant began operations in the area, brought soccer to the long-suffering people of Kula Kingdom and their neighbors with the provision of critical infrastructure, award of scholarships and creation of jobs for the youths, the founder of Belema Oil is described as an unrivaled change agent in Kula Kingdom and its environs. Since the creation of this community, every oil, oil companies that are, that, is, uh, that are operating in this community have neglected Kula community. No good project in this community embarked by one of these uh, oil uh, companies. Today, God has brought our son to give us light because all the time we are in darkness. Every community, every kingdom that has the privilege and the honor to enjoy such opportunities, we want the presence of such company to remain. If there are other opportunities that need to come to the territory, we will still want Milma Oil to inherit that opportunity. <laughs> Milma Oil is not just a son, but he has been sent as a messiah. The paradox of poverty in the midst of plenty was indeed heightened by the unique geographical location of Kula Kingdom, which, lying in the mouth of the Atlantic, has had to contend with transport and communication challenges over the years. To the relief of Kula Kingdom, Balema Oil is constructing a 6.5-kilometer road that will link the town to its satellite communities. In its determination to further open up the area for rapid development, Belema Oil has commenced preliminary works on the 85-kilometer Kula Potakot Road project, which on completion will provide direct access to the oil-rich Kula Kingdom by road. We are very happy for our son. It's not only Kula, he's also doing it in other communities where he's also doing one or two things because Belema Oil is not in Meduguri, but our son is doing something in Meruguri. So it's not only Kula, we should pray for him, give him, God should, Almighty God should give him more strength, more wisdom to do more things for Kula Kingdom. We're going to have the Belema Atlantic Island in Kula Kingdom. We're going to have the Belema Industrial Base in Kula Kingdom. We're going to have the Belema Atlantic Office sure. in Kola Kingdom. And maybe let me let you know what this means, this particular one. It means that Belema Oil Producing Limited, upon completion of the Belema Atlantic Office, will relocate its operations to Kola Kingdom. Now, when we are here in Kola Kingdom, we are closer to our people than ever before. And that is what your son, Engineer Jack Richter, has already started doing. In attendance at the Thanksgiving service was the Amanabo of Kula Kingdom, His Majesty, Dr. Kroma Amabibi Eleki. 
engineer, Jack Christian engineer, has planted a lot of projects in our kingdom. And it behoves on all of us, both young and old, men and women, youths, to water that project so that it will come to a fruition. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, I'm watering the projects for success. In recognition of the immense contributions of engineer Jack Christine to the development of his kingdom, the Kula monarch had made a public declaration of his intention to honor a worthy son in no distant time. Let God bless his family in the mighty name of Jesus. It's a pity, and I'm a bit disappointed, that the founder, president, engineer Jack Christine is not here. If one is falling, and somebody helps him to wake up. Why do you call that person? Ekpeke. Destiny of So our founder is Kula Ekpeke. It's the Ekpeke of Kula Kingdom. And I will yes with him. You should give us a day. We will install him officially as chief engineer. Chakris Ten Junior, okay. Ekpeke of Polakito. <laughs> Inside the Niger Delta. Well, that's the size of our package on this edition of the program. You can stay connected by following us on our social media handles showing on your screen right now. Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil rich region, will be back same time next week. Until then, I'm yours sincerely, Mamode Akuga, thanking you for staying tuned. Bye for now.